So Senator Rennick has the call. Hi, how are you going? Morning, Senator. Uh, just as a starter, I thought I'd ask, what exactly is the role of the Office uh, of Gene Technology and how do you work with the TGA um, with medicines and drugs that okay. involve gene technology? Um, Raj Bula, Gene Technology Regulator. Thank you for your question, Senator. Um, so the Office of the Gene Technology <coughs> Regulator is responsible for authorising all activities with genetically modified organisms and some of the... Um, gene technology or the techniques that go with developing genetically modified organisms. Um, in terms of our interface with the TGA, we are responsible for the uh, authorisation of research activities. So we, our, most of our research stakeholders involve hospitals, clinical settings, uh, universities, um, also we the other side of it, which is not TGA related, is to do with agricultural cropping and yep. genetically modified crops. With the TGA, uh, there is a little bit of overlap in terms of commercial therapeutic GM products, but that's something that we're working through in terms of streamlining through the third review of the gene technology scheme and a number of recommendations in that review. Okay, thank you. Now, I note that obviously the COVID vaccines had gene technology in them. Uh, what uh, role did the Office of Gene Technology play in reviewing the safety of those vaccines? Uh, we don't actually review the safety or the efficacy of any therapeutic product. That's the role of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So our, our role in terms of the risk assessment is limited to just looking at the containment of the genetically modified organism, you know, with most of the vaccines being um, an AAV, a virus, within the vaccine. We look at the people that are working and administering the vaccine. We look at how it's, if it's imported, the author authorizations for import, storage, transport, and disposal. So our role in terms of the assessment is fairly limited to just looking at the environmental risks and making sure that the GMO is being handled correctly through all the stages up to administration and to a patient. Okay, so I guess my concern is, is that given these vaccines have, have used gene technology for the first time, there's a gap in the regulation of the gene technology. And I, and I ask that because we put in a, um, freedom of excuse me, a freedom of information a few months ago about the genotoxicity of the vaccine. Um, and the reply that the TGA uh, gave back was that they hadn't reviewed docs, documents relating to the genotoxicity. Now, Professor Skerritt said last week that may be commercial in confidence. Um, I would have a problem with that if that was the case because safety data shouldn't be commercial in confidence at all. Um, so I guess what I want to know is who's responsible for the safety uh, of you know, gene-coded products, medical products? So Excuse to me. go back to the start of your question, um, a number of genetically <coughs> modified or <coughs> vaccines that contain genetically modified organisms have been registered through the OGTR for a number of years. Not so much in terms of um, human vaccines, but a lot of them for uh, animal vaccines. A number of vaccines have been approved for uh, vector control, so treatment of malaria, um, things around Ross River virus, um, dengue, that kind of thing. So it's, this is not new to the Office of the okay, Gene okay, Technology okay. Regulator. Well, with that in Coming mind, back to the genotoxicity yeah. question, that's entirely a question for the TGA. Okay, so with that in mind, and I'm happy to take, Professor Skerritt can answer this as well, sorry. <coughs> just lost my voice when I, just when I needed it. Um, in regards to, um, I'll wait for Professor Skerritt to come up. So in regards to the um, trials on Pfizer, the initial biodistribution studies were done on animals, and those biodistribution studies showed that lipid nanoparticles went to all organs, or a lot of the organs in the body. It didn't just sit, stay in the deltoid muscle. Um, and secondly, they didn't use the active ingredient in the test, so they used luciferase instead of the actual mRNA-encoded um, spike protein. 
So can we, so I'm curious to know, were any trials done on animals and in, you know, prior to the rollout of the vaccine on biodistribution studies in human beings with the active ingredient mRNA? I'll just clarify for you, Senator, that the mRNA vaccines are not required to be regulated through the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator. Okay, that's yep. fine, and that's why I've asked uh, Professor Skerritt, because yep. it may be, uh, that my confusion is where the responsibility lies as well. So if it, it is the TGA, that's fine. Hmm. So the dose of uh, the lipids in the vaccine is below the threshold uh, that internationally is assessed for genotoxic toxicity and carcinogenicity. I mean, these lipids are commonly used in a range of other human therapeutics, and even at higher levels there isn't uh, evidence of genotoxicity. Okay, so I, I accept that, but the lipids yep. carry the active ingredient, which is the mRNA. Correct, yeah. Right, so, so there's two issues. That's fine. I'm not saying the lipids themselves mm. are toxic. There's Some people suggest mm. that, and we can have that discussion another day. My first concern is the distribution of the lipid nanoparticles throughout the body because they are carrying the active ingredient, which is the mRNA. And, and, and they are distributed uh, through a range of parts of the body, as are lipids that you have if you have a sausage or a, a steak yes. for breakfast. Yes, yep. Uh, and uh, the lipids are hydrolyzed, destroyed by the body uh, fairly rapidly, as are dietary lipids. Okay, so, so you accept that these, so that the lipid nanoparticles carrying the mRNA can go to other organs in the body. So let's say the heart, for example. They can go around the body, but, yep. uh, but with no evidence of any ill effects. So there was no evidence that the heart, for example, didn't take up a, heart muscles, heart cells didn't take up nanolipid particles carrying the mRNA, and then the heart cells didn't start expressing a spike protein, that, thus inducing the immune system to start attacking heart muscles. <coughs> there is some evidence that uh, the rare situation of myocarditis uh, a known adverse effect, rare, yep. uh, rare but known, uh, does have uh, a potential basis in an immune reaction affecting the heart. And we do know that any medicine is distributed uh, around the body, but then uh, rapidly broken down. So there's still a lot of both fundamental and clinical research going on to look at the mechanism of myocarditis. Uh, in, uh, in response to the messenger RNA vaccines. But uh, one of the other questions, of course, with anything that is rare is why do those individuals uh, have that event? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, good why question. is it more yeah. prevalent with particular ages? Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, young children seem, seem to have extremely, uh, extremely low case of myocarditis. There seems to be a peak around uh, in young, in young uh, men and older adolescents, so there might be a testosterone relationship as a male thing. So all that research is actively underway, both clinical and, and, and laboratory. And this is my models. point, is why hasn't this research been done prior to the uh, Well, out? Senator, if you'd wanted yeah. a couple of million people in Australia potentially hospitalised and killed from COVID, uh, you could have had that, because this research takes a couple of years to, to do. Well, well so it would I have been, that. Uh, sorry, if I can finish my yeah. answer, Senator. Uh, in order to understand these things, it would have been another year or two or three until these vaccines would have been released. And I think Professor Kelly eloquently described the impact of vaccines uh, in this country. And so there is always going to be uh, research on issues that emerge. And, okay. of course, my, and that's so, a separate issue. I'm not talking about the risks of COVID here. I'm talking about the risks of the vaccine and that there is quality assurance that needs to be complied with. Now, I should also no, no, pick The two up. are totally connected, Senator. But, I, I, uh, I accept that. And if you want to look at the actual risk reward benefits for younger people, right, there are a lot of younger people who've had severe vaccine injuries that is going to impact them for the rest of their lives. OK, so the relative risk for young people of taking a vaccine... Senator, I disagree, with your, uh, I disagree with your assertion. I disagree with your assertion. Sorry, we'll yeah. just, we'll let the question be asked yeah. and the question answered and then we'll clarify it. That would be good. Okay, so I want to come back to why was there no studies done on humans of the biodistribution of the lipid nanoparticle with the active ingredient? So they used luciferase, which is a benign enzyme. They didn't actually use the spike protein. Senator, the uh, we will uh, consult on what information we can provide from the dossiers. Remember, we have received over 200,000 pages of information with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, some of it is commercial and confident, some is not. And again, there's a formal process where we can identify what information can be received. So I'm not going to categorically okay. say there were no such studies done. 
Okay, right. Okay, well, and, and I must say that you've now said there's hundreds of thousands of pages. In, to in, about 220,000. Okay, because in the, in the Freedom of Information request, you said no data was available whatsoever. So I don't know, you know, you're contradicting yourself, number one. Number two, I struggle with the concept that safety data should ever be commercial in confidence. I mean, we are looking at, you know, the lives that... The health Senator, that's not a TGA decision. It's the law of a land when commercial in confidence information okay, is submitted. So, so and, who and do I sorry, need to bring if, that if, up I can, with? if I can finish my answer, I believe the FOI request was slightly different. Now, we can go into the detail, but as you know, uh, when departments or officials get an FOI request, they obviously have to address the terms of the FOI request, and if it's uh, not specific enough, we go back to the requester and say, can you be a bit more specific? Uh, what do you want? But uh, Well, this, that Freedom of Information request was very specific. I mean, that was specific right down to the, to the level of the biochemistry that was taking place, so I, I don't see how you could say that. But let's move on to that anyway, because this is now the next question. Is the spike protein produced by the vaccine is not the spike protein same spike protein produced by the virus, is it? So we've got two pro-line insertions, we've got three stop codons instead of one, we've got the use of uh, pseudouridine instead of hmm. uridine, and we've also got the use of a, a long chain of adenosine nucleotides at the end of the mRNA. Poly A tails are common at the end of messenger RNAs. Yeah, Senator, you've added, you've yeah. added a lot. Yeah, I realise that, but you've added another 70. So there's been another 70 or so added. And as you said the other day, that was to increase the stability of the spike protein. Increases the stability, but the additional stop codons also prevent uh, any risk of uh, translation beyond the uh, length of the desired piece of mRNA that... Uh, trans Sorry, I'm getting a little bit biochemical here. The desired piece of messenger RNA that turns into the spike protein. So it's actually put in as an additional safety measure to, ha to create these additional stop codons. So there is no stop codon read through? It is put in there, there's no evidence of stop codon read through okay. and, and that's so, why so, there's two, there that's why there's additional that? stop codons, yes. In fact, even in Australia, in the TGA labs, we do in vitro uh, translation assays to confirm the identity of a product. So in vitro is in laboratory? In vitro is, in vitro, well, well that's sorry. the only way that you can assess in a laboratory whether a piece of RNA makes a piece of protein that you want it to do, then you get the bit of protein and you make sure it's the right size and the right identity. So, so then you have measured that the, the, the created spike protein has got the same molecular, molecular weight as the virus spike It will protein. have a slightly different molecular weight because uh, of the position of, a, of the uh, stop codons and the, and the use of pseudouridine, the additional uracil, which is one of the four bases of messenger RNA. So it, it is very similar and it is as expected and as provided. So in the 220,000 pages of information we get on these vaccines, we get an awful lot of technical information on how they assess this product, what checks and balances they have put in to make sure that it is an appropriate uh, spike protein that is uh, translated, to use the technical word. Uh, and our laboratories then spend a lot of time with a team of people. We have 105 people roughly in our laboratories. Uh, we spend a lot of time replicating what Pfizer or AstraZeneca or any other company yep. has given us. Uh, we don't just take their laboratory testing stuff as gospel. We actually have people with white lab coats who do this stuff to, to repeat and replicate their work. Okay, thank you. So, so what does the ProLine insertions do to the actual spike protein? Uh, we believe there's not a functional change as far as immunogenicity and as far as behaviour. Sometimes proline is used to stabilise what's known as a tertiary structure and sometimes even a quaternary structure, in other words, a three-dimensional. Now, I do feel like I'm giving a biochemistry lecture. Uh, the three-dimensional structure of the actual uh, spike protein because you want the body's immune system to recognise the spike protein that's been translated, converted from a messenger RNA into a protein yep. You want the body to recognise it in the same way that the body would recognise the virus protein if you're infected with the virus. That, that's one of the tricks of a good vaccine. It's got to look like the disease, but it's not got to cause the disease. Okay. Fifteen minutes, it's just about... <coughs> oh, OK, I've got a bit of time there. OK, so, so then tell me this. What is the stop? What is the off switch for the production of the spike protein by the mRNA? So the off switch for translation, in other words, conversion of a messenger yep. RNA to protein, uh, is, is actually the fact that there are, is a stop code, in this case, a couple of stop codons. OK, but then you've then got a spike protein sitting within a cell, right? Now, does the cell express that spike protein or not? 
So the uh, translation of proteins occurs on ribosomes, not in the nucleus of a cell. So yeah, I realise that. Yeah. yeah that. Okay. Yeah. No, you had asserted earlier that there was nu- in, in other fora you've asserted there's nuclear uh, uptake, but. Uh, our bodies translate proteins, uh, as we're all sitting here, we're probably translating yeah. tens of thousands of proteins at a time. So that happens in the cytoplasm uh, on, on bodies known as ribosomes. Yeah, yeah I, I know that. So then it gets expressed. The spike protein gets expressed out of the cell, right? Does it not? Because you've got to wait for the killer T cells. So effectively... Well, well no, no, it's, it's, both, it's both D cells and T cells. Uh, the T- OK, so the T cells, the B cells are going to get the antibodies, the T cells are going to get the cells, right? Hmm. So you've now got a, a toxic cell, right, that has It's has not MRNA. a toxic cell, it's reacting well, to... Well, it's, it's producing a spike protein, yeah. right? But, but, and that's, that's but going you, to be your, the Your B cells and T cells, as you sit here, are reacting against foreign proteins and, and other foreign substances. I mean, in, otherwise, in the blood. Otherwise, otherwise, we'd all die within, within days to... Bacteria oh, oh, and other yeah, things. Okay, can you stop interrupting me and actually yeah. answer no, my question? Yeah, question. yeah, sorry, Chair, but he's not uh, actually Senator, answering yeah, my question. Just, yeah. cool. yeah. so just make the point. Um, I think Senator Reynick, um, you know, suggesting that the official is interrupting you, I, I think you probably should look in the mirror. Sorry, You're doing Chair. A fair bit of interrupting Chair, yourself. He's not answering the question. That's well, I the think problem. He is answering Senator the question. You okay. may not like his answer, but no, I think no, 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 no. He's not answering the question, which is what then kills the cell that is producing the spike protein. Okay, so the cells, so remember, it's the messenger tra- RNA that's translated into protein, which is a spike protein. Messenger RNAs are inherently unstable. In fact, that's why the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines require this little whippered coat, this little whippered nanoparticle. I, I understand that. No, well, so therefore, the messenger RNAs get digested by what, what are known as nucleases within the cell. So they break down in a matter of minutes to hours with inside the cell. So therefore, you're, it's done its work. It's made a little bit of spike protein. That then goes to the immune cells to create a response analogous to being infected. But the, the, the bottom line is, messenger RNA is unstable. And so it does break down. Uh, OK, because I was given 48 Quite, hours for the half-life of mRNA. It, no, it, it depends very much on the messenger RNA. I don't believe that 40... I mean, I'm happy to provide you with a review okay, that, on, on half lives of messenger RNA. I don't believe it's 48 hours across the board. OK, but in, in that 48 hours, that spike protein, there's going to be an enormous amount of spike protein produced, isn't there? Well, not an enormous amount, because remember, the amounts of vaccine pro- uh, messenger RNA are in the microgram level. So you ha- the idea is to produce sufficient spike protein to activate the immune system so it mimics a COVID infection so your B cells and T cells can start to mount an immune response to protect the person from catching COVID. OK, so, so does that spike protein, before the, the immune system kicks in, how far will those spike proteins travel throughout the body? They will travel throughout the, the circulation, as, as will other foreign proteins until they're, they're trapped by the immune system. Right, so how much damage will they do before they're trapped by the immune system? No evidence of damage. I mean, you, you seem to be indicating that these are little arrows that are piercing holes in things. Well, well, well I'm, I'm going off... protein does not by itself Sorry, cause, cause I'm, I'm going off the fact there's 118,000 adverse events reported. There's a safety signal there. There's a massive red flag. A normal flu vaccine will report a couple of hundred adverse events a year but, off 11 or 12 million doses. And yet here we are with 118,000. No, no, this is a range of adverse... We've talked before about the difference between an adverse event uh, report and a known adverse event agreed in the product information. There are certainly uh, an order of magnitude fewer adverse events that are acknowledged in the product information. And those that, they are those that are recognised to be adverse events following assessment of all those reports by global regulators. So there's not 118 known adverse events to messenger RNA vaccine. Authorised G. Rennick, LMP Chermside.